All right, today is gonna be a chill day. If you like my shit, uh, like the video, subscribe. We're gonna get into some more of the Kabbalah <laughs> and its connection to the Hermetic principles. Um, I could go into the books, but people that already studied it, why not let them explain it? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I got the Zohar. Um, it's a good read. Uh, these type of things are self-development things like the Kabbalah, the Kabbalion, uh, Emerald Tablets, um, the Corpus Hermeticum, um, the Quran, the Circle 7. They all connect to the earthly plane in uh, the history of mankind and how we understood the three, six, and nine and the connection between that and us and how we are one in the same with the universe, which why would we believe anything other than that before unless we were brainwashed into believing you know, we are nothing but a speck of dust and whatever we do doesn't matter or count. But once you find out that whatever you do does matter and whatever you say does count, uh, the, the world is consistent in this. When you read all of the ancient books from India, China, Africa, Egypt, uh, Europe, Central America, South America, all these stories uh, echo each other in, in, in its story. May not have the same names, may not have the same uh, exact, exact story, but the stories uh are reminiscent to one each other, like uh, creation of man, flood, um, how evil had got into the world, right? It's all consistent. So let's get into some of the Zohar right here. I meant to cue this up. Sorry about that, guys. Jump in right here. Hello, and welcome again to Kabbalah Revealed. I'm Tony Kozenek. This is the type of stuff you have to constantly go over this stuff in order to understand it. Like, you can't just read it one time, two times, and understand it. You have to read it. Live a little bit of life, apply it to your life so that you can see that it actually is true. In our first show, we did an overview of what Kabbalah is about, what it is and what it isn't. And if you recall, what Kabbalah is for is for a person who asks the question, what is the meaning of my life? So let's see where we go from here. Let's start with a definition of Kabbalah and see what that definition is and where it can lead us. Kabbalah is a wisdom, a science, that enables man, a person, to feel and know an upper reality. This is how it addresses the purpose of life, but of course it brings up questions. What is a person? What is a man? What is an upper reality? And what is it that enables a person to feel, know, and enter an upper reality? If you recall, uh, we looked at this diagram before in which we see that we live, our existence happens within a complete and total reality. Uh, that depends on nothing, 
that uh, is unbounded, in which everything is completely interconnected, uh, that is filled with infinite pleasure, complete knowing, and contact with everything that exists in reality. And yet the Kabbalists tell us, the ones who have attained this whole system, tell us that there, for a certain purpose, we descended from this way of existence, this way of being, through a system called worlds. Worlds are uh, olamim, uh, from the Hebrew word olam, which comes from the root he'elem, which means to hide, hiddenness. And we descended from this complete connection with reality until we reached a, a place, a crossover point called a barrier, and our existence happens in a very, very limited way here in a place called our world. Our world is a place that has no sensation whatsoever of any of these worlds, and these are spiritual worlds, all of these. This is what's considered to be the physical world or corporality. So, if you want to know the purpose of life, the meaning of your life, it would be a good thing if you knew uh, what the plan was. And it seems like that's an impossible thing. It's, it's almost the source of jokes that anyone could possibly answer that question about the meaning and purpose of life. But that's where the Kabbalists start. Those who have attained this entire reality tell us that there is a plan, a blueprint for all of reality and for all so, The material world is consistent with uh, the Ten Commandments, right? The Hermetic Principles is consistent with the worlds that he's talking about above um, in the spiritual realm, which is the mental realm, right? Because you can get there through men, uh, mental exercises like meditation. In those realms, there is no time or space. I mean, time. Uh, there is space, uh, but not space in the way that you look at there's a distance between me and someone else. So. For all of creation. They tell us that the purpose of life is to create a creature and to fill that creature with unbounded delight. To create a creature and to fill the creature with unbounded delight. That is the complete and total meaning, purpose, direction of everything that ever can occur, will occur, only happens for that purpose. In that thought, in that intention, in that thought behind all of creation, all of the rules for everything that would occur were set down. All the principal laws that govern uh, the spiritual and physical worlds all are rooted in that one thought. And nothing that happens in this world happens for any other reason than in order to create a creature and bring that creature to unbounded delight. So what is it that keeps a person... Okay, some things you just have to allow people to uh, give out their beliefs. Whether you believe it or not, it should not matter. It's the meat and potatoes of the information that he disseminates, right? Um... Do, does the creator, does um, everything from the spiritual world want you to be happy? Why not? Why would you think otherwise? <laughs> right? Is there benevolent and benevolent beings, meaning good and evil beings? Of course. Of course. There's good people and there's bad people. You see people shoot other people before without a cause or beat people without a cause. These things, you know, it's normal. It's an out of the spiritual world. What is a person? Well, we have to understand how our perception of this reality, the way in which we perceive reality, causes a hiddenness for us. This is a person, a closed box with five openings. These five openings are our five senses. Now, surrounding the person 
is an upper reality, uh, a complete reality, the spiritual. And from that complete reality, things approach us. That is... Uh, now, mind you, <laughs> this video came out in 2011. And it took me this long to really fully grasp and understand this teaching of perception of reality. Right? Everybody gets these... He's going to go over it. What appears to be an exterior reality of some sort of un, unformed something approaches the person. Also, if you want to learn more about what he's talking about here, you want to go into quantum mechanics. In quantum mechanic theory, they took particle beams and sprayed them at a wall with two walls, one with the slits in them and the wall behind it uh, receives the particle beams. So go check that out. It'll give you a little bit of understanding of who you are in the middle and everything around you, what it really is and how it becomes into focus within your mind based off of your perception. And through the five senses that we possess, we determine what that thing is. In other words, what does reality consist of according to my senses? So this spiritual object approaches the box, but something odd happens here. It doesn't actually enter the box. The box is a closed system because rather than this object coming in, it hits a barrier, a kind of transducer, like an eardrum or a retina or uh, a nerve on, on the surface of the skin or a taste bud. And instead of getting the, the thing on the outside, this thing gets reduced and is passed through a program, this thing here. And as it passes through this program, it gets interpreted into something that we can understand according to certain principles within the program. Once it passes through this, it leaves our box or this machine, and what it produces is our reality. So it doesn't matter how uh, sensitive this sensor is, let's say it's your eye, it can be the Hubble telescope, or it could be, you could be completely nearsighted and unable to see the thing directly in front of you. It doesn't matter the degree of sensitivity. What matters is the programming. What happens here within this subjective system in the machine? Whatever it is that comes into here can only be what this program says that it is. Not what this is, but a reduction that can be understood by the program. So this is basically showing you how you could be deceived. And he's going to show you the exercises of, of realizing between the deception and what is really being conveyed. Right? So what is this program that limits this? This is objective reality, and this is the limited portion of it that we can perceive. This program is called egoism. It's self-concern. What's in it for me? How is this going to affect me? So that's where you see the ego. <laughs> The ego leads to arguments because you don't want people to tell you you're wrong. But being wrong doesn't mean you're wrong. You get it? It just means you didn't have all of the information. Once you get more information, the picture becomes clearer. They didn't teach us this type of stuff in school about our self, about how our mind works, perception, uh, 
uh, senses work, how data works when it's given to us and we observe it. This is what he's doing. The last time, the last video, Kabbalah and Hermetic Principles Connected, he gave you the levels above you. You can't even get to those levels until you understand the level you're in right now. The world you're in now. As a result of this, I'm locked into, the person is locked into a subjective view of all these things only in relation to how it feels inside of the box. And at no point does it have any sense of what really exists outside of the box. So here's where uh, the hermetic principles come in. The ego is, is this information good or bad? But you have to keep the ego in check and say, okay, it might be bad, but what else other information is there that substantiates this or makes this null and void? But if we don't exercise these uh, practices of of discernment between good and evil within ourself, we fly off the hinges when it doesn't match the preconceived notions that we built into our ego. Right? So then we'll, we're locked in a hate type of, 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 we're locked in a hate type of mindset everything oh that's bad so i'm gonna hate on it or i'm gonna yell at the person that's telling me something different or i'm gonna fight somebody that doesn't like what i like this is the ego speaking when you're watching people argue fight be mad um gossip about other people and negative things that's the ego that's not really you that's your ego protecting the programming that you are you have boss so we've got a problem because every single one of our five senses works by exactly the same program not one of them can tell us anything about what exists outside of that program so in order to know what surrounds us what the greater reality is we need to develop an additional sense what the Kabbalists call a sixth sense not the sixth sense of the lady who tells your fortune but a sense that actually can make contact with what exists outside that is not bounded by that kind of programming and in order to do that well you have to need to do it it's not possible to work outside to build something outside of this box as long as we are satisfied with what's in it for me mm -hmm. but the thought of creation has built in it uh, laws that bring a person to this complete fulfillment there is a motivating force that allows us to come to the point where we need to get out of the box. Mm. And if we understand both what we are, which is the will to receive what's in this for me, uh, that we are built uh, as egoists, but that's okay, because it's actually what we need in order to reach this fulfillment. There's nothing wrong with it. We just have to learn how to use it, how to harness it, and how to harness the force of development that the thought of creation has provided for us. So the CIA uh, released some of the information on the brain, uh, the left and right hemisphere. There's also documents and videos of experiments that they had where they uh, split the brain in two because there's a sensor between the right and the left brain and it's connected and they snipped that and they watched how the left brain reacts and the right brain reacts. And this is who we are and it, they're connected to each other. And the CIA has put out papers on this about how the brain works mag uh, through magnet magnetic fields, through uh, meditation, through hypnosis, through a, a number of things. And this is what he's, he's explaining. Now, you could dispute what we are all day, you know, but that is something he's saying what we are as far as how we are me mechanically um, 
produced mentally. He's not talking about your mater the material, your world right now. He does get into that type of stuff. There's other books that get into the material world. You could go and read it if you want to. But this right now is about the mind. Uh, so. so what is it that moves things in reality? What makes things happen? Nobody does anything in this world, whether it's an inner thing or whether it is a spiritual thing that is, that is beyond this world. Everything that, that happens, happens only as a result of, well, let's look at it. You're sitting there. You're maybe shifting in your chair where your eyes are moving to. Maybe you're, you've picked up something to drink. Any motion that you are now involved in is happening only as a result of one calculation. That you have become uncomfortable where you are, that a need has evolved in you, has appeared, and you have moved to, to a new position or a new situation that you believe will bring you more pleasure than the one that you were in before. This uh, lack and the filling of pleasure and a force of desire is what motivates everything in reality. And this will eventually take a person from the corporal world, from our perceptions of the physical world, the limitations that we experience and the suffering that goes along with it. And it will bring a person, if properly used, past that barrier and into the spiritual world in this way. We all feel desires, and we feel them change, but we don't really pay attention to this system that is placed in us by nature well enough so that we can understand what it's doing for us. We all understand that our first sort of grasp of what pleasure is, uh, is just survival type pleasures. The first category, we see pleasure as and require sex, food, and shelter. All of our efforts, our work, what we perceive around us, the whole goal of our lives has to do with finding and getting these things. And this is a desire that we have in common with animals. It doesn't require other people. We just need this to survive. And once we have this filled, we realize that life is about much more than that, and we can't be satisfied with it. And a second category of desires appears. This is a desire for wealth. Wealth is the accumulation of the first category so that I'll never have to worry about it again. I will be able to control it. And once we fill this desire for wealth, uh, we come to the feeling that is that all there is? Something else grows in us. Now, notice that it's not simply that it's another uh, desire that's growing, but it's a greater desire, one that encompasses the one before it. In other words, here we have a small desire and a small filling. And here we have a desire that is grown and it requires a greater filling. And this one is incorporated in this one. So now, if I can't be filled by wealth, there's a new desire that, that arises in me and that is a desire for power. This doesn't happen only to the individual in their lives, but it's happened to humanity as a whole throughout history. The whole scope of history has been the evolution of these desires. So. Some of us don't realize we have to go back to being like babies and realize that we really don't understand reality, right? We think that we do, and we think that our own ideas and plans that we come up with are our own, but they were given to us from when we were children, from our parents, from our church, from our schools from the TV, right? There's no other place you got information from. I don't wanna hear anybody tell me that they didn't get information from these places. You can also get information for books if you're more diligent. And depending on the books that you read, it can still sway you. They can still sway you with books, just depending on what books you read, right? So he says the first thing you start to do is you want sex, food, and shelter. Anybody else can say that's not uh, uh, the base form of humans, right? It kind of feels like that's where we're stuck at, right, as a people. 
Power is the ability to control both this and this, all systems that will bring me the greatest collection of that. Now, this is political power, this is empire, this is control in my job. And once I have that, I can no longer be satisfied with it. I be Hold on. So I brought up the CIA and the paperwork that they came out with about how the brain works. So if you know these things and you want to manipulate a people, you give them what power is. You give them what wealth is. You give them what food is. Right? You give them the ideas of what these things is. Power is the government. Who has the power? The government. Who is the government? Not you. <laughs> what is wealth? Green money. Green paper. Fiat. That's money. As long as you get that and you get abundance of it, you can be rich. We could take it away from you if we want. These are the ideas that they instilled. But because gold is uncentral, decentralized, and they can't control gold or silver, right? They can control Bitcoin. They can control all these uh, crypto things that is connected to the internet. But they can't control gold and silver. So they give you what wealth is. Then, food. Where's food? It's in the grocery stores. Who sells the food? The grocery stores. Why didn't they teach you to grow your own food? To have your own greenhouse see they teach you these things so that you stay within the realm of control once you get out of the realm of control they can't stop it come empty i feel a lack and a fourth desire is placed inside of me a greater expanded desire for something that encompasses all of that, and that is knowledge. Knowledge is the barrier, in a sense, of what it is that we define as the physical world. These desires, one, two, three, and four, all have to do with what we perceive as pleasure, that is, what we are being filled with and what we want, what will satisfy us. Well, knowledge is science, uh, it is religion, it's art, it's the pinnacle of what we consider to be what humanity could possibly achieve. And yet anybody who seriously delves into this very great desire and attempts to fill it eventually discovers that this is empty as well that there are no answers in science for the real causes of things. There's, because there's no answer to purpose. There's only mechanical answers. And the answers only have to do with these desires. Religion, though it gives us beliefs, cannot give us access to what it is that we really want, a direct knowledge. And so once a person is, becomes empty as a result of having this fulfilled, something very different and very special happens. Yeah, I see that. You see how knowledge is bigger than power? You see that? See, people don't really understand what this is about. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Knowledge being more important than this. And what they do? What they do? They made you think that this is all there is. What they say? They say, um... If you want to hide something from black people, you put it in a book. You see? Knowledge. Knowledge of self is key. A new desire arises. But this desire is not a desire from this world. This is a desire placed within our heart, which is the sum of all desires that we have, both for this world and for what's beyond it. A desire is placed in us from a completely other level of development, from the greater reality. And what appears inside of our heart is a point in the heart. That's what the Kabbalists call it. This point is a part of the greater reality. It, is, it has an aspect of spirituality which, if this desire becomes fulfilled, unlike these, it grows continually until it fills our entire experience, our entire existence, and can bring us 
into the spiritual world. So what is an upper reality? Well, the Kabbalists who have attained the totality of reality tell us that it consists of a particular quality. They tell us that we are created in exact opposite phase to the quality that exists in the upper worlds. And this is why we cannot perceive what's there. It appears as though there's nothing there at all. We know from the drawing that what we consist of, what the man or the person or the creature consists of, is egoism. That's what's inside of the box. And what's inside of the box is called the will to receive. And this will to receive makes us experience limited existence, uh, makes us experience suffering, uh, isolation, and all of the things that we find difficult about life. And what exists outside of this in the non-subjective condition of egoism is an objective reality that the Kabbalists tell us is the will to bestow. The will to bestow is unconditional altruism. Bestowing is um, charity. It's in the scriptures. It's charity. To give, to help out, to, uh, you know, make sure someone else is eating. You know, the, the 13, the three fishes to 500 people type situation right Christ received the power to uh, extend the food so that people could eat Paul talked about it see we get into these books and we uh, break down the books from our lack of understanding because we don't like <laughs> Certain people. I just don't like Christ. He wasn't real. He stole something. I don't like Paul. He was against Christ. He was trying to kill the prophets. Never about that. It's about the meat and the potatoes. What is in there that they've learned that they wish that it took the, 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 they said, I want to give this to the future. <laughs> They had the desire to give it to the future so bad that they wrote it down. They didn't have to do none of that. In other words, the experience out here is unlimited existence, unbounded pleasure, and delight. And yet, we can't feel this because we have no means to get there, or do we? There is a quality of the spiritual world that differs also uh, in, its, uh, in its quality from the physical world. In the physical world, movement, what would get us from one place to another, is purely mechanical. That is, I can take two objects that are completely different in their form, even in their purpose, and I can draw them close together mechanically, and I can say, we have closeness here. But uh, in the spiritual world, things can only be considered to be close under completely different conditions because there is no time and there is no space. There's nothing mechanical there. The Kabbalists... So if there's no time and space, what does that mean? Everything is there. The future is there. The past is there. What you're doing right now is there. What your, your girlfriend, your boyfriend, your husband, your wife, your children, your grandparents, what they've done, what they didn't do, what they lied about, it's all there. They call it the Akashic Records, but we probably need a better term for it. I think Edgar Casey came up with it or something like that. I'm not sure. But the Akashic Records and the levels above the head that he was speaking about. See, they, they say the ch seven chakras, right? They talk about the seven chakras. The chakras are the light, uh, light centers in the body. But they don't ever expound on the purple chakra that is above the head. How do you reach the purple chakra above your head? The energy, the light, 
above your head. Think about that, did you? You thought the purple chakra was in the brain? No, it's above the head. One above. Think about it. Just tell us that the spiritual world is made up only of... Hold on, let me get it, because you may not believe me. Because we're almost done here. You feel me? See? Above the head. Above. You know, some you, you you're gonna get some that says it's in the in there, but you still see there's one above the head. Alright. You can bypass all the chakras and get to that one by just what? Receiving knowledge. Knowledge is the key. Because the brain controls everything. And then you can get the rest of them in control. Of feeling states, of spheres of influence that have to do with certain attributes, qualities, inner qualities. And that all movement in spirituality uh, consists of similarity or dissimilarity between two feeling states or two qualities. In other words, we can see this in friendship. If my friend takes a certain delight in, in comedy and I don't care for comedy, I'm just a serious person, then it's not very likely that we're going to be very close friends. If I hate comedy, then, uh, then we are considered to be distant. But if I love comedy and I love the same comedians and the same films that they did, then in this respect of of the love of comedy, my friend and I are close in that feeling. In other words, in spirituality, if two attributes, two feelings are similar, they're considered to be close. If they are different, they're considered to be distant. But... Once again, <laughs> once again, go look into quantum mechanics and how two uh, electrons can be, you know, opposite of each other and and uh, react to each other. It's like magnets. And this is the most beautiful and precious thing for us, the thing that can actually move us from the physical into the spiritual. And that is that if they have exactly the same quality and purpose and intention then they are the same thing. They are bonded, connected. And it's this law called the law of equivalence of form that can get us from our egoistic state of separation to be able to build an additional sense that can feel what's outside. What we need to do... The sixth sense, you see what I'm saying? It's right above your head. Uh, and you could feel it and you can uh, and you want your third eye to connect to it this is this is science that's been known we just been lied to sorry is to build within us a similar frequency a similar quality an additional sense that has a quality of this bestowal within it though we're not yet capable of perceiving it in its simplicity, the Kabbalists tell us that there are only two things that exist in reality. There is only the creator and the creature. Everything that we perceive is simply the quality of the creator and the qualities of the creature. The creator is the upper world and the creature is the lower world. The quality of the Creator is the will to bestow. The quality of the creature is the will to receive. So what is he saying? I, you want to give to charity, you want to give your time, you want to help kids learn to ride bikes, you want to teach kids how to read or, you know, economics, that's the will to bestow, right? You want to 
help build farms and greenhouses and help people that love technology get into those type of fields will to bestow the will to receive is sex food uh anything that um feels a desire tattoos um anything that's fleshly right these are <laughs> god made everything in twos this is all that exists and Getting out of the box means that what we need to do is to move in spiritual space. And moving in spiritual space means to change this quality, the will to receive of the quality of the creature, to become more and more similar to the quality of the creator. The way in which... So once you become closer to the creator and you understand uh, how the creator works, it's different. So, yeah, man, with that, I'm Furious Black. I appreciate you watching. If you like um, like my videos, like it. Hit the thumbs up. It's right there under my video. Uh, share it. It's right there. Uh, and, you know, thanks for watching, guys. Peace.